This is a reading of the article Fiat Money Inflation in France. Fiat Money Inflation in France. How it came, what it brought, and how it ended. Early in the year 1789, the French nation found itself in deep financial embarrassment. There was a heavy debt and a serious deficit. The vast reforms of that period, though a lasting blessing politically, were a temporary evil financially. There was a general want of confidence in business circles. Capital had shown its proverbial timidity by retiring out of sight as far as possible. Throughout the land was stagnation. Statesmanlike measures, careful watching and wise management would doubtless have, ere long, led to a return of confidence, a reappearance of money, and a resumption of business. But these involved patience and self-denial. And thus far in human history, these are the rarest products of political wisdom. Few nations have ever been able to exercise these virtues, and France was not then one of these few. There was a general search for some short road to prosperity. Ere long, the idea was set afloat that the great want of the country was more of the circulating medium, and by that is meant fiat currency. And this was speedily followed by calls for an issue of paper money. The Minister of Finance at this period was Necker. In financial ability, he was acknowledged as among the great bankers of Europe. But his was something more than financial ability. He had a deep feeling of patriotism and a high sense of personal honor. The difficulties in his way were great, but he steadily endeavored to keep France faithful to those principles in monetary affairs, which the general experience of modern times had found the only path to national safety. As difficulties arose, the National Assembly drew away from him, and soon came among the members renewed suggestions of paper money. Orators in public meetings at the clubs and in the assembly proclaimed it a panacea, a way of, quote, securing resources without paying interest. Journalists caught it up and displayed its beauties. Among these men, Marat, who, in his newspaper The Friend of the People, also joined the cries against Necker, picturing him, a man of sterling honesty who gave up health and fortune for the sake of France, as a wretch seeking only to enrich himself from the public purse. Against this tendency towards the issue of irredeemable paper, Necker continued as best he might. He knew well to what it always had led, even when surrounded by the most skilled guarantees. Among those who struggled to support ideas similar to his was Burgas, a deputy from Lyon, whose pamphlets, then and later, against such issues, exerted a wider influence, perhaps, than any others. Parts of them seem fairly inspired. Anyone today reading his prophecies of the evils sure to follow such a currency would certainly ascribe to him a miraculous foresight, were it not so clear that his prophetic power was due simply to a knowledge of natural laws revealed by history. But this current in favor of paper money became so strong that an effort was made to breast it by a compromise, and during the last months of 1789 and the first months of 1790 came discussions in the National Assembly looking to issues of notes based upon the landed property of the Church, which was to be confiscated for that purpose. But care was to be taken. The issue was to be largely in the shape of notes of 1,300 and 200 livres, too large to be used as ordinary currency, but of convenient size to be used in purchasing the church lands. Besides this, they were to bear interest, and this would tempt holders to hoard them. The assembly thus held back from issuing smaller obligations. Remembrances of the ruin which had come from the great issues of smaller currency at an earlier day were still vivid. And, Steph, by the by... This refers to John Law, a Scottish financier who was responsible for Mississippi Bubble when France still owned Louisiana in the early parts of the 18th century, who issued ruinous paper notes and uh, created many millionaires, destroyed an economy. He was actually a murderer. He had murdered a man in a duel and I guess had turned later in life to murdering currencies as a more efficient way of bringing ruin to people. And so the experience that 
uh, French people had in memory of John Law's currency is referred to several times in this article. And it was 80 years previously, which meant that people remembered their fathers being ruined by this kind of fiat currency. So that's what he's uh, referring to here. And uh, we will continue. Yet the pressure toward a popular currency for universal use grew stronger and stronger. The Finance Committee of the Assembly reported that, quote, the people demand a new circulating medium, that, quote, the circulation of paper money is the best of operations, that, it is the most free because it reposes on the will of the people, that it will bind the interest of the citizens to the public good. The report appealed to the patriotism of the French people with the following exhortation. Let us show to Europe that we understand our own resources. Let us immediately take the broad road to our liberation, instead of dragging ourselves along the tortuous and obscure paths of fragmentary loans. It concluded by recommending an issue of paper money carefully guarded to the full amount of 400 million livres. And the argument was pursued until the objection to smaller notes faded from view. Typical in the debate on the whole subject, in its various phases, were the declarations of Monsieur Matrineau. He was loud and long for paper money, his only fear being that the committee had not authorized enough of it. He declared that business was stagnant, and that the sole cause was a want of more of the circulating medium, that paper money ought to be made a legal tender, that the assembly should rise above prejudices which the failures of John Law's paper money had caused several decades before. Like every supporter of irredeemable paper money then or since, he seemed to think that the laws of nature had changed since previous disastrous issues. He said, Paper money under a despotism is dangerous, it favors corruption, but in a nation constitutionally governed, which itself takes care of the emission of its notes, which determines their number and use, that danger no longer exists. He insisted that John Law's notes at first restored prosperity, but that the wretchedness and ruin they caused resulted from their over-issue, and that such an over-issue is possible only under despotism. Monsieur de la Rechefoucault gave his opinion that, quote, the assignats will draw specie out of the coffers, where it is now hoarded. On the other hand, Casalet and Marie showed that the results could only be disastrous. Never, perhaps, did a political prophecy meet with more exact fulfillment in every line than the terrible picture drawn in one of Casalet's speeches in this debate. Still, the current ran stronger and stronger. Pession made a brilliant oration in favor of the report, and Necker's influence and experience were gradually worn away. Mingled with the financial argument was a strong political plea. The National Assembly had determined to confiscate the vast real property of the French Church, the pious accumulations of 1,500 years. There were princely estates in the country, bishops, palaces and conventual, buildings in the towns. These formed between one-fourth and one-third of the entire real property of France, and amounted in value to at least 2,000 million livres. By a few sweeping strokes, all this became the property of the nation. Never, apparently, did a government secure a more solid base for a great financial future. There were two special reasons why French statesmen desired speedily to sell these lands. First, a financial reason to obtain money to relieve the government. Secondly, a political reason to get this land distributed among the thrifty middle classes and so commit them to the revolution and to the government which gave their title. It's a step this would be equivalent to the welfare warfare state of modern times. To continue. It was urged then that the issue of 400 millions of paper, not in the shape of interest-bearing bonds as had been first proposed, but in notes small as well as large, would give the treasury something to pay out immediately and relieve the national necessities that, having been put into circulation, this paper money would stimulate business, that it would give to all capitalists, large and small, the means of buying from the nation the ecclesiastical real estate, and that from the proceeds of this real estate the nation would pay its debts and also obtain new funds for new necessities. Never was theory more seductive to both financiers and statesmen. It would be a great mistake to suppose that the statesmen of France or the French people, were ignorant of the dangers of issuing irredeemable paper money. 
No matter how skillfully the bright side of such a currency was exhibited, all thoughtful men in France remembered its dark side. They knew too well from that ruinous experience seventy years before in John Law's time, the difficulties and dangers of a currency not well based and controlled. They had then learned how easy it is to issue it, how difficult it is to check its over-issue, how seductively it leads to the absorption of the means of the working men and the men of small fortunes, how heavily it falls on all those living on fixed incomes, salaries, or wages, how securely it creates on the ruins of the prosperity of all men of meager means a class of debauched speculators, the most injurious class that a nation can harbor, more injurious indeed than professional criminals whom the law recognizes and can throttle, how it stimulates overproduction at first and leaves every industry flaccid afterwards, how it breaks down thrift and develops political and social immorality. All this France had been thoroughly taught by experience. Many then living had felt the result of such an experiment the issues of paper money under John Law, a man who to this day is acknowledged one of the most ingenious financiers the world has ever known. And there were then sitting in the National Assembly of France many who owed the poverty of their families to those issues of paper. Hardly a man in the country who had not heard those who issued it cursed as the authors of the most frightful catastrophe France had then experienced. It was no mere attempt at theatrical display, but a natural impulse which led a thoughtful statesman during the debate to hold up a piece of that old paper money and to declare that it was stained with the blood and tears of their fathers. And it would also be a mistake to suppose that the National Assembly which discussed this matter was composed of mere wild revolutionists. No inference could be more wide of the fact. Whatever may have been the character of the men who legislated for France afterward, no thoughtful student of history can deny, despite all the arguments and sneers of reactionary statesmen and historians, that few more keen-sighted legislative bodies could ever have met than this first French constitutional assembly. In it were such men as Sayez, Bayet, Necker, Mirabeau, Talleyrand, Dupont, de Nemours, and a multitude of others who, in various sciences and in the political world, had already shown and were destined afterwards to show themselves among the strongest and shrewdest men that Europe has yet seen. But the current towards paper money had become irresistible. It was constantly urged, and with a great show of force, that if any nation could safely issue it, France was now that nation. That she was fully warned by her severe experience under John Law. That she was now a constitutional government controlled by an enlightened patriotic people, not as in the days of the former issues of paper currency, an absolute monarchy controlled by politicians and adventurers that she was able to secure every livre of her paper money by a virtual mortgage on the landed domain, vastly greater in value than the entire issue, i.e. the church. That with men like Bayet, Mirabeau, and Necker at her head, she could not commit the financial mistakes and crimes from which France had suffered under John Law, the regent Duke of Orléans, and Cardinal Dubois. Oratory prevailed over science and experience. In April 1790 came the final decree to issue 400 millions of livres in paper money, based upon confiscated property of the church for its security. The deliberations on this first decree and on the bill carrying it into effect were most interesting. Prominent in the debate being Necker, Dupont de Demour, Marie, Cazalet, Pession, Bayet, and many others hardly inferior. The discussions were certainly very able. No person can read them at length in the Monitor, nor even in the summaries of the parliamentary history, without feeling that various modern historians have done wretched injustice to these men, who were endeavouring to stand between France and ruin. This sum, four hundred millions, so vast in those days, was issued in Assignat, which were notes secured by a pledge of productive real estate and bearing interest to the holder at three per cent. No irredeemable currency has ever claimed a more scientific and practical guarantee for its goodness and for its proper action on public finances. On the one hand, it had what the world recognized as a most practical security, a mortgage on productive real estate of vastly greater value than the issue. On the other hand, as the notes bore interest, there seemed cogent reason for their being withdrawn from circulation whenever they became 
redundant. And the reason that this is important, it's Steph. The reason this is important is if you keep issuing new paper and old paper does not get retired, you end up with inflation. You want the old paper or the old paper currency to be retired from use, to be hoarded, to be put away, to not be used for commerce. Otherwise, you get rampant inflation. So the fact that it bears interest means it's not going to be spent as common currency. And that was the idea. To continue with the article. As speedily as possible, the notes were put into circulation. Unlike those issued in John Law's time, they were engraved in the best style of the art. To stimulate loyalty, a portrait of the king was placed in the center. To arouse public spirit, patriotic legends and emblems surrounded it. To stimulate public cupidity, the amount of interest which the note would yield, each day to the holder was printed in the margin. And the whole was duly garnished with stamps and signatures to show that it was carefully registered and controlled. To crown its work, the National Assembly, to explain the advantages of this new currency, issued an address to the French people. In this address, it spoke of the nation as delivered by this grand means from all uncertainty and from all ruinous results of the credit system. It foretold that this issue would bring back into the public treasury, into commerce, and into all branches of industry, strength, abundance, and prosperity. Some of the arguments in this address are worth recalling, and among them the following. Paper money is without inherent value, unless it represents some special property. Without representing some special property, it is inadmissible in trade to compete with the metallic currency, which has a value real and independent of the public action. Therefore, it is that the paper money, which has only the public authority as its basis, has always caused ruin where it has been established. That is the reason why the bank notes of 1720, issued by John Law, after having caused terrible evils, have left only frightful memories. Therefore it is that this National Assembly has not wished to expose you to this danger, but has given this new paper money not only a value derived from the national authority, but a value real and immutable, a value which permits it to sustain, advantageously, a competition with the precious metals themselves. But the final declaration was perhaps the most interesting. It was as follows. Those assignats bearing interest as they do will soon be considered better than the coin now hoarded and will bring it out again into circulation. The king was also induced to issue a proclamation recommending that his people receive this new money without objection. Now, it's stuff again. I just wanted to make a comment here. There's a fundamental flaw, of course, in this whole process, the whole process that went on, and it's a flaw that is the same as what occurs in uh, in the modern world under taxation. The money that was circulating in France after the Revolution was money that represented already and included the productive value of the church lands, as I say, between a quarter and a third of French land. So on the French lands, things were grown and they were sold and people rented and and houses were built and, and canals were dug and so on. And the money that circulated was already represented this economic value. And so to have the state steal the land of the church and then issue currency based upon that was as artificial as printing currency without a basis because the money circulating already took into account all of that economic activity. Having it change hands does not add value to the economy. Like if I sell you a house that I live in and I move, we don't have a new house. Right. I mean, we don't have I mean, it's, it's useful to you and it's useful to me. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it. But we don't have a new house. Simply transferring ownership, particularly by force, does not create any new value. So stripping the church of its land and then issuing notes based upon it was as inflationary as if they had just printed money themselves. And this is the danger of having very eloquent and persuasive people doing evil things or pursuing evil actions. So this is why what happens or what is going to happen in this story ended up happening. It's one of the reasons. And the reason that this is important relative to what happens in the modern world is that governments claim that their paper currency is valuable because of the economic productivity of the citizens and, in particular, the interest that they pay on the debt is valuable because they can steal money from people through taxation in the future, which is exactly the same as stealing the church lands. It doesn't add any economic activity for you to have 30, 40, 50 percent of your money taken through force. All it does is enrich the criminals, and it does not add to any economic activity. In fact, it detracts from it, 
And this is why this theft of the church lands is analogous to the theft of taxation. Without getting into all the moral complications of how the church got its land throughout uh, French history, I just wanted to point out that theft does not create value, but rather destroys it. And any paper currency based on theft, which is all paper currency that is issued by the state, is inherently inflationary. And to say that there's any real value behind it is a complete misnomer, even if we say, well, there's taxation or the theft of the church lands or whatever. So, to continue. All this caused great joy, i.e. the issuance of the money and the justifications. Among the various utterances of this feeling was the letter of Monsieur Sarrault, directed to the editor of the Journal of the National Assembly and scattered throughout France. Monsieur Sarrault is hardly able to contain himself as he anticipates the prosperity and glory that this issue of paper is to bring to his country. One thing only vexes him, and that is the pamphlet of Monsieur Bergasse against the Assignats. Therefore, it is after a long series of arguments and protestations, in order to give the final proof of his confidence in the paper money and his entire skepticism as to the evils predicted by Bergasse and others, Monsieur Sarrault solemnly lays his house, garden, and furniture upon the altar of his country and offers to sell them for paper money alone. There were indeed some gainsayers. These especially appeared among the clergy, who naturally abhorred the confiscation of church property. Various ecclesiastics made speeches, some of them full of pithy and weighty arguments against the proposed issue of paper, and there is preserved a sermon from one priest threatening all persons handling the new money with eternal damnation. But the great majority of the French people who had suffered ecclesiastical oppression so long regarded these utterances as the wriggling of a fish on the hook, and enjoyed the sport all the better. Just step again, just because they imagined that the government that could steal from the church would never steal from them through inflation, right? To continue. The first result of this issue was apparently all that the most sanguine could desire. The treasury was at once greatly relieved. A portion of the public debt was paid. Creditors were encouraged. Credit revived. Ordinary expenses were met. And a considerable part of this paper money having thus been passed from the government into the hands of the people, trade increased. And all difficulties seemed to vanish. The anxieties of Necker and the prophecies of Marais and Cazalet seemed proven utterly futile. And indeed, it is quite possible that, if the national authorities had stopped with this issue, few of the financial evils which afterwards arose would have been severely felt. The 400 millions of paper money then issued would have simply discharged the function of a similar amount of specie, i.e. currency based on copper or gold or silver. But soon there came another result, Times grew less easy by the end of September, within five months after the issue of the 400 millions in Assignat. The government had spent them and was again in distress. What a shock! The old remedy immediately naturally recurred to the minds of men. Throughout the country began a cry for another issue of paper. Thoughtful men then began to recall what their fathers had told them about the seductive path of paper money issues in John Law's time and to remember the prophecies that they themselves had heard in the debate on the first issue of Essignas less than six months before. At that time, the opponents of paper had prophesied that once on the downward path of inflation, the nation could not be restrained, and that more issues would follow. The supporters of the first issue had asserted that this was a calumny, that the people were now in control, and that they could and would check these issues whenever they desired. The condition of opinion in the assembly was therefore chaotic. A few schemers and dreamers were loud and outspoken for paper money. Many of the more shallow and easygoing were inclined to yield. The more thoughtful endeavoured to breast the current. One man there was who could have withstood the pressure, Mirabeau. He was the popular idol, the great orator of the assembly, and much more than a great orator. He had carried the nation through some of its worst dangers by a boldness almost godlike. In the various conflicts he had shown not only oratorical boldness, but amazing foresight. As to his real opinion on an irredeemable currency, there can be no doubt. It was the opinion which all true statesmen have held, before his time and since, in his own country, in England, in America, in every modern civilized nation. In his letter to Saruti, 
written in January 1789, hardly six months before. Mirabeau had spoken of paper money as, quote, a nursery of tyranny, corruption and delusion, a veritable debauch of authority in delirium. In one of his early speeches in the National Assembly, he had called such money when Asson covertly suggested its issue, quote, a loan to an armed robber, and said of it, quote, that infamous word, paper money, ought to be banished from our language. In his private letters written at this very time, which were revealed at a later period, he showed that he was fully aware of the dangers of inflation. But Mirabeau yielded to the pressure partly because he thought it important to sell the government lands rapidly to the people, and so develop speedily a large class of small landholders pledged to stand by the government which gave them their titles, partly doubtless from a love of immediate rather than of remote applause, and generally in a vague hope that the severe inexorable laws of finance, which had brought heavy punishments upon governments emitting an irredeemable currency in other lands at other times, might in some way be warded off from France. The question was brought up by Montesquieu's report on the 27th of August, 1790. This report favoured, with evident reluctance, an additional issue of paper. It went on to declare that the original issue of 400 millions, though opposed at the beginning, had proved successful, that assignats were economical, though they had dangerous, and, as a climax, came the declaration, quote, We must save the country. Upon this report, Mirabeau then made one of his most powerful speeches. He confessed that he had at first feared the issue of assignats, but now he dared urge it. That experience had shown the issue of paper money most serviceable, that the report proved the first issue of assignats a success, that public affairs had come out of distress, that ruin had been averted and credit established. He then argued that there was a difference between paper money of the recent issue and that from which the nations had suffered so much in John Law's time. He declared that the French nation had now become enlightened, and he added, quote, Deceptive subtleties can no longer mislead patriots and men of sense in this matter. He then went on to say, We must accomplish that which we have begun, and declared that there must be one more large issue of paper money, guaranteed by the national lands and by the good faith of the French nation. To show how practical the system was, he insisted that just as soon as paper money should become too abundant, it would be absorbed in rapid purchases of national lands. And he made a very striking comparison between this self-adjusting, self-converting system and the rains descending in showers upon the earth, then in swelling rivers discharged into the sea, then drawn up in vapor, and finally scattered over the earth again in rapidly fertilizing showers. Ah, the Barack Obama of his time proving once more that there is nothing more dangerous than eloquent corruption. To continue. He predicted that the members would be surprised at the astonishing success of this paper money and that there would be none too much of it. His theory grew by what it fed upon, as the paper money theory has generally done. Toward the close, in a burst of eloquence, he suggested that the assignats be created to an amount sufficient to cover the national debt, and that all the national lands be exposed for sale immediately, predicting that thus prosperity would return to the nation, and that all classes would find this additional issue of paper money a blessing. This speech was frequently interrupted by applause. A unanimous vote ordered it printed, and copies were spread throughout France. The impulse given by it permeated all subsequent discussion. Gué arose and proposed to liquidate the national debt of 2,400 millions, to use his own words, by one simple operation, grand, simple, magnificent. This, quote, operation, was to be the emission of 2,400 millions in legal tender notes, and a law that specie should not be accepted in purchasing national lands. His oratory bloomed forth magnificently. He advocated an appeal to the people who, to use his flattering expression, quote, ought alone to give the law in a matter so interesting. The newspapers of the period, in reporting his speech, noted it with the very significant remark, this discourse was loudly applauded. To him replied Brelat Savarin, 
He called attention to the depreciation of assignats already felt. He tried to make the assembly see that natural laws work as inexorably in France as elsewhere. He predicted that if this new issue were made, there would come a depreciation of 30%. Singular that the man who so fearlessly stood against this tide of unreason has left to the world simply a reputation as the most brilliant cook that ever existed. He was followed by the Abbé Goutet, who declared, what seems grotesque to those who have read the history of an irredeemable paper currency in any country, that new issues of paper money, quote, will supply a circulating medium which will protect public morals from corruption. Into this debate was brought a report by Necker. He was not, indeed, the great statesman whom France especially needed at this time of all times. He did not recognize the fact that the nation was entering a great revolution, but he could and did see that, come what might, there were simple principles of finance which must be adhered to. Most earnestly, therefore, he endeavored to dissuade the assembly from the proposed issue, suggesting that other means could be found for accomplishing the result, and he predicted terrible evils. But the current was running too fast. The only result was that Necker was spurned as a man of the past. He sent in his resignation and left France forever. The paper money demagogues shouted for joy at his departure. Their chorus rang through the journalism of the time. No words could express their contempt for a man who was unable to see the advantages of filling the treasury with the issues of a printing press. Marat, Herbe, Camille de Moulin, and the whole mass of demagogues so soon to follow them to the guillotine were especially jubilant. Continuing the debate, Rubel attacked Necker, saying that the assignats were not at par because there were not yet enough of them. He insisted that payments for public lands be received in assignats alone, and suggested that the church bells of the kingdom be melted down into small money. Le Brun attacked the whole scheme in the assembly, as he had done in the committee, declaring that the proposal, instead of relieving the nation, would wreck it. The papers of the time very significantly say that at this there arose many murmurs. Chabru came to the rescue. He said that the issue of assignats would relieve the distress of the people, and he presented very neatly the new theory of paper money and its basis in the following words. The earth is the source of value. You cannot distribute the earth in a circulating value, but this paper becomes representative of that value, and it is evident that the creditors of the nation will not be injured by taking it. On the other hand, appeared in the leading paper, The Moniteur, a very thoughtful article against paper money, which sums up all by saying, quote, It is then evident that all paper which cannot, at the will of the bearer, be converted into specie, cannot discharge the functions of money. This article goes on to cite Mirabeau's former opinion in his letter to Saruti, published in 1789, the famous opinion of paper money as, quote, a nursery of tyranny, corruption, and delusion, a veritable debauch of authority and delirium. Le Blachet, in the assembly, quoted a saying that, quote, paper money is the emetic of great states. Botido, resorting to phrase-making, called the assignats un papier terre, or land converted into paper. Paralandre answered vigorously and foretold evil results. Pamphlets continued to be issued, among them one so pungent that it was brought into the assembly and read there. The truth which it presented with great clearness, being simply that doubling the quantity of money, or substitutes for money, in a nation simply increases prices disturbs values, alarms capital, diminishes legitimate enterprise, and so decreases the demand both for products and for labor. That the only persons to be helped by it are the rich who have large debts to pay. This pamphlet was signed, A Friend of the People, and was received with great applause by the thoughtful minority in the assembly. Dupont de Demont, who had stood by Necker in the debate on this first issue of Assignats, arose avowed the pamphlet to be his, and said sturdily that he had always voted against the emission of irredeemable paper, and always would. 
how things stay the same. Far more important than any other argument against inflation was the speech of Talleyrand. He had been among the boldest and most radical French statesmen. He, it was, a former bishop, who more than any other had carried the extreme measure of taking into the possession of the nation the great landed estates of the church, and he had supported the first issue of 400 millions. But he now adopted a judicial tone, attempted to show to the assembly the very simple truth that the effect of a second issue of assignats may be different from that of the first. That the first was evidently needed, that the second may be as injurious as the first was useful. He exhibited various weak points in the inflation fallacies and presented forcibly the trite truth that no laws and no decrees can keep large issues of irredeemable paper at par with specie. In his speech occurred these words, quote, You can indeed arrange it so that the people shall be forced to take a thousand livres in paper for a thousand livres in specie, but you can never arrange it so that a man shall be obliged to give a thousand livres in specie for a thousand livres in paper. In that fact is embedded the entire question, and on account of that fact, the whole system fails. The nation at large now began to take part in the debate. Thoughtful men saw that here was the turning point between good and evil, that the nation stood at the parting of the ways. Most of the great Commercial cities bestirred themselves and sent up remonstrances against the new emission, 25 being imposed and 7 in favor of it. But eloquent theorists arose to glorify paper, and among these, Royer, who on September the 14th, 1790, put forward a pamphlet entitled Reflections of a Patriotic Citizen on the Issue of Assignats, in which he gave many specious reasons why the assignats could not be depressed, and spoke of the argument against them as the vile clamours of people bribed to affect public opinion. He said to the National Assembly, quote, If it is necessary to create 5,000 millions and more of the paper, decree such a creation gladly. He too predicted, as many others have done, a time when gold was to lose all its value, since all exchanges would be made with this admirable, guaranteed paper, and therefore that coin would come out from the places where it was hoarded. He foretold prosperous times to France, in case these great issues of paper were continued, and declared these, quote, the only means to ensure happiness, glory, and liberty to the French nation. Speeches like this gave courage to a new swarm of theorists. It began to be especially noted that men who had never shown any ability to make or increase fortunes for themselves abounded in brilliant plans for creating and increasing wealth for the country at large. Greatest force of all, on September the 27th, 1790, came Mirabeau's final speech. The most sober and conservative of his modern opponents speaks of its eloquence as prodigious. In this, the great orator dwelt first on the political necessity involved, declaring that the most pressing need was to get the government lands into the hands of the people, and so to commit to the nation and against the old privileged classes, the class of landholders thus created. Through the whole course of his arguments, there is one leading point enforced with all his eloquence and ingenuity, the excellence of the proposed currency, its stability and its security. He declares that being based upon the pledge of public lands and convertible into them, the notes are better secured than if redeemable in specie, that the precious metals are only employed in the secondary arts, while the French paper money represents the first and most real of all property, the source of all production, the land, that while other nations have been obliged to admit paper money, none have ever been so fortunate as the French nation, for the reason that none had ever before been able to give this landed security that whoever takes French paper money has practically a mortgage to secure it, and on landed property, which can easily be sold to satisfy his claims, while other nations have been able only to give a vague claim on the entire nation. And, he cries, I would rather have a mortgage on a garden than on a kingdom. Other arguments of his are more demagogical. 
He declares that the only interests affected will be those of bankers and capitalists, but that manufacturers will see prosperity restored to them. Some of his arguments seem almost puerile, as when he says, If gold has been hoarded through timidity or malignity, the issue of paper will show that gold is not necessary, and it will then come forth. But, as a whole, the speech was brilliant. It was often interrupted by applause. It settled the question. People did not stop to consider that it was the dashing speech of an orator and not the mature judgment of a financial expert. They did not see that calling Mirabeau or Talleyrand to advise upon a moment monetary policy, because they had shown boldness in danger and strength in conflict, was like summoning a prize fighter to mend a watch. In vain did Maurice show that while the first issues of John Law's paper had brought prosperity, those that followed brought misery. In vain did he quote from a book published in John Law's time, showing that Law was at first considered a patriot and a friend of humanity. In vain did he hold up the assembly one of Law's bills and appeal to their memories of the wretchedness brought upon France by them. In vain did Dupont present a simple and really wise plan of substituting notes in the payment of the floating debt, which should not then form a part of the ordinary circulating medium. Nothing could resist the eloquence of Mirabeau. Barnave, following, insisted that, quote, Law's paper was based upon the phantoms of the Mississippi, ours upon the solid basis of ecclesiastical lands, and he proved that the assignats could not depreciate further. Prudhomme's newspaper poured contempt over gold as security for the currency, extolled real estate as the only true basis, and was fervent in praise of the convertibility and self-adjusting features of the proposed scheme. In spite of all this plausibility and eloquence, a large minority stood firm to their earlier principles, but on the 29th of September, 1790, by a vote of 508 to 423, the deed was done. A bill was passed authorizing the issue of 800 millions of new assignats, but solemnly declaring that in no case should the entire amount be put in circulation exceed 1,200 millions. To make assurances doubly sure. It also provided that as fast as the assignats were paid into the treasury for land, they should be burned, and thus a healthful contraction be constantly maintained. Unlike the first issue, these new notes were to bear no interest. Great were the plaudits of the nation at this relief. Among the multitudes of pamphlets expressing this joy which have come down to us, the friend of the revolution is the most interesting it begins as follows. Citizens, the deed is done. The assignats are the keystone of the arch. It has just been happily put in position. Now I can announce to you that the revolution is finished, and there only remains one or two important questions. All the rest is but a matter of detail which cannot deprive us any longer of the pleasure of admiring this important work in its entirety. The provinces and the commercial elites which were at first alarmed at the proposal to issue so much paper money, now send expressions of their thanks. Specie is coming out to be joined with paper money. Foreigners come to us from all parts of Europe to seek their happiness under laws which they admire. And soon France, enriched by her new property and by the national industry which is preparing for fruitfulness, will demand still another creation of paper money. France was now fully committed to a policy of inflation. And if there had been any question of this before, all doubts were removed now by various acts very significant, as showing the exceeding difficulty of stopping a nation once in the full tide of a depreciating currency. The National Assembly had from the first shown an amazing liberality to all sorts of enterprises, wise or foolish, which were urged for the good of the people. As a result of these and other largesses, the old cry of the lack of a circulating medium broke forth again, and especially loud were the clamours for more small bills. The cheaper currency had largely driven out the dearer. Paper had caused small silver and copper money mainly to disappear. All sorts of notes of hand circulating under the name of confidence bills flooded France. Sixty-three kinds in Paris alone. This unguaranteed currency caused endless confusion and fraud. Different districts of France began to issue their own assignats in small denominations. 
and this action stirred the National Assembly to evade the solemn pledge that the circulation should not go above 1,200 millions, and that all assignats returned to the Treasury for lands should immediately be burnt. Within a short time there had been received into the Treasury for lands 160 million livres in paper. By the terms of the previous acts, this amount of paper ought to have been retired. Instead of this, under the plea of necessity, the greater part of it was reissued in the form of small notes. There was indeed much excuse for new issues of small notes, for under the theory that an issue of smaller notes would drive silver out of circulation, the smallest authorized assignat was for 50 livres. To supply silver and copper and hold it in circulation, everything was tried. Citizens had been spurred on by law to send their silverware and jewels to the mint. Even the king sent his silver and gold plate, and the churches and convents were required by law to send to the government melting pot all silver and gold vessels not absolutely required for public worship. For copper money, the church bells were melted down. But silver and even copper continued to become even more and more scarce. By the way, this is occurring because everybody recognizes that inflation in paper is inevitable and they hold on to that which actually has some more objective and real value, i.e. copper, silver, gold, currency, to continue. In the midst of all this, various juggleries were tried, and in November 1790, the Assembly decreed a single standard of coinage, the chosen metal being silver, and the ratio between the two precious metals was changed from 15.5 to 1 to 14 and a half to one. But all in vain. It was found necessary to issue the dreaded small paper, and a beginning was made by issuing 100 millions in notes of five francs, and ere long, obedient to the universal clamor, there were issued parchment notes for various small amounts down to a single sou, which is, I think, about a nickel or so. Yet each of these issues, great or small, was but as a drop of cold water to a parched throat. Although there was already a rise in prices which showed that the amount needed for circulation had been exceeded, the cry for more circulating medium was continued. The pressure for new issues became stronger and stronger. The Parisian populace and the Jacobin Club were especially loud in their demands for them, and a few months later, on June 19, 1791, with few speeches and in a silence very ominous, a new issue was made of 600 millions more, less than nine months after the former great issue with its solemn pledges to keep down the amount in circulation. With the exception of a few thoughtful men, the whole nation again sang hymns of praise. In this comparative ease of new issue is seen the action of a law in finance as certain as the workings of a similar law in science. If a material body fell from a height, its velocity is accelerated by a well-known law in a constantly increasing ratio. So in issues of irredeemable currency, in obedience to the theories of a legislative body or of the people at large, there is a natural law of rapidly increasing emission and depreciation. The first inflation bills were passed with great difficulty, after very sturdy resistance, and by a majority of a few score out of nearly a thousand votes. But we observe now that new inflation measures were passed more and more easily, and we shall have occasion to see the working of this same law in a more striking degree as this history develops itself. During the various stages of this debate there cropped up a doctrine old and ominous. It was the same which appeared towards the end of the 19th century in the United States during what became known as the Greenback Craze and the Free Silver Craze. By France, it had been refuted a generation before the revolution by Turgot, just as brilliantly as it was met a hundred years later in the United States by James A. Garfield and his compeers. This was the doctrine that all currency, whether gold, paper, leather, or any other material, derives its efficiency from the official stamp it bears, and that this being the case, a government may relieve itself of its debts and make itself rich and prosperous, simply by means of a printing press fundamentally the theory which underlay the later American doctrine of fiat money. There came mutterings and finally speeches in the Jacobin Club, in the Assembly, and in newspaper articles and pamphlets throughout the country, taking this doctrine for granted. 
These could hardly affect thinking men who bore in mind the calamities brought upon the whole people, and especially upon the poorer classes, by the same theory as put in practice by John Law, or as refuted by Turgot. But it served to swell the popular chorus in favor of the issue of more assignats, and plenty of them. The great majority of Frenchmen now became desperate optimists, declaring that inflation is prosperity. Throughout France there came temporary good feeling. The nation was becoming inebriated with paper money. The good feeling was that of a drunkard just after his draft, and it is to be noted, as a simple historical fact corresponding to a physiological fact, that as drafts of paper money came faster, the successive periods of good feeling grew shorter. Various bad signs began to appear. Immediately after each new issue came a marked depreciation. Curious, it is to note, the general reluctance to assign the right reason. The decline in the purchasing power of paper money was in obedience to the simplest laws in economics, but France had now gone beyond her thoughtful statesmen and had taken refuge in unwavering optimism, giving any explanation of the new difficulties rather than the right one. A leading member of the assembly assisted in an elaborate speech that the cause of depreciation was simply the want of knowledge and of confidence among the rural population, and he suggested means of enlightening them. La Rochefoucauld proposed to issue an address to the people showing the goodness of the currency and the absurdity of preferring coin. The address was unanimously voted. It might well have been attempted to show that a beverage made by mixing a quart of wine and two quarts water would possess all the exhilarating quality of the original undiluted liquid. Attention was aroused by another menacing fact. Specie disappeared more and more. The explanations of this fact also displayed wonderful ingenuity in finding false reasons and in evading the true one. A very common explanation was indicated in Prud'homme's newspaper, Le Révolution de Paris, of January 17, 1791, which declared that coin, quote, will keep rising until the people shall have hanged a broker. Another popular theory was that the Bourbon family were, in some mysterious way, drawing off all solid money to the chief centres of their intrigues in Germany. Comic, and at the same time pathetic, were evidences of the widespread idea that if only a goodly number of people engaged in trade were hanged, the par value of the assignats would be restored. It's the same here now, I'm just saying, when we get mad at the people in Wall Street rather than the Fed. To continue, still another favorite idea was that British emissaries were in the midst of the people instilling notions hostile to paper. Great efforts were made to find these emissaries, and more than one innocent person experienced the popular wrath under the supposition that he was engaged in raising gold and depressing paper. Even Talleyrand, Shrewd as he was, insisted that the cause was simply that the imports were too great and the exports too little. As well might he explain the fact that when oil is mingled with water, water sinks to the bottom by saying that this is because the oil rises to the top. This disappearance of specie was the result of a natural law as simple and as sure in its action as gravitation. The superior currency had been withdrawn because an inferior currency could be used. I would also add that the paper currency, since it was losing value every day, had to be spent quickly rather than the coins, which kept their value and, in fact, increased it relative to the fiat currency. To continue. Some efforts were made to remedy this. In the municipality of Kiabuf, a considerable amount in specie having been found in the possession of a citizen, the money was seized and sent to the assembly. The people of that town treated this hoarded gold as the result of unpatriotic wickedness or madness, instead of seeing that it was but the sure result of a law working in every land and time, when certain causes are present. Marat followed out this theory by asserting that death was the proper penalty for persons who thus hid their money. Still another troublesome fact began now to appear. Though paper money had increased in amount, prosperity had steadily diminished which is, of course, as I'm just inserting here, the same as in the USA since the 1960s. To continue, in spite of all the paper issues, commercial activity grew more and more spasmodic. Enterprise was chilled and business became more and more stagnant. Mirabeau, in his speech, 
which decided the second great issue of paper, had insisted that though bankers might suffer, this issue would be of great service to manufacturers and restore prosperity to them and their workmen. The latter were, for a time, deluded, but were at last rudely awakened from this delusion. The plenty of currency had at first stimulated production and created a great activity in manufacturers, but soon the markets were glutted and the demand was diminished. In spite of the wretched financial policy of years gone by, and especially in spite of the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, by which religious bigotry had driven out of the kingdom thousands of its most skillful Protestant workmen, the manufacturers of France had before the revolution come into full bloom. In the finer woolen goods, in silk and satin fabric of all sorts, in choice pottery and porcelain, in manufacturers of iron, steel, and copper, they had again taken their old leading place upon the continent. All the previous changes had, at the worst, done no more than to inflict a momentary check on this highly developed system of manufacturing. But what the bigotry of Louis XIV and the shiftlessness of Louis XV could not do in nearly a century was accomplished by this tampering with the currency in a few months. One factory after another stopped. Oh, and just to jump in, this is partly because of the business cycle as described by the Austrian economists. And also, it's called stuffing the pipe in in some ways, like if you stimulate a bunch of economic activity by the issuing of of, uh, paper currency, what happens is people go out and buy a whole bunch of stuff, like they go out and buy five pairs of shoes, and all that means is that next year they don't need any shoes. So you get this massive overinvestment in shoe production, the next year you get a depression in the shoe industry because people don't have infinite needs. And if they buy something now, they're not going to buy it tomorrow or next month. So stimulating production and consumption in the moment takes away the organic growth of an economy and gives it this horrible up and down spikiness, which of course we've been seeing consistently as well. So to continue. At one town, Lodev, 5,000 workers were discharged from cloth manufacturers. Every cause except the right one was assigned for this. Heavy duties were put upon foreign goods. Everything the tariffs and customs houses could do was done. Still, the great manufactories of Normandy were closed. Those of the rest of the kingdom speedily followed, and vast numbers of workers in all parts of the country were thrown out of employment. Nor was this the case with the home demand alone. The foreign demand, which at first had been stimulated, soon fell off. In no way can this be better stated than by one of the most thoughtful historians of modern times, who says, quote, It is true that the first assignats gave the same impulse to business in the city as in the country, but the apparent improvement had no firm foundation, even in the towns. Whenever a great quantity of paper money is suddenly issued, we invariably see a rapid increase of trade. The great quantity of the circulating medium sets in motion all the energies of commerce and manufacturers. Capital for investment is more easily found than usual, and trade perpetually receives fresh nutrients. If this paper represents real credit founded upon order and legal security from which it can derive a firm and lasting value. Such a movement may be the starting point of a great and widely extended prosperity, as, for instance, the splendid improvement in English agriculture was undoubtedly owing to the emancipation of the country bankers. If, on the contrary, the new paper is of precarious value, as was clearly seen to be the case with the French assignats as early as February 1791, it can confer no lasting benefits. For the moment, perhaps, business receives an impulse, all the more violent because everyone endeavors to invest his doubtful paper in buildings, machines, and goods, which, under all circumstances, retain some intrinsic value. Such a movement was witnessed in France in 1791, and from every quarter there came satisfactory reports of the activity of manufacturers. But for the moment, the French manufacturers derived great advantage from this state of things. As their products could be so cheaply paid for, orders poured in from foreign countries to such a degree that it was often difficult for the manufacturers to satisfy their customers. It is easy to see that prosperity of this kind must very soon find its limit. When a further fall in the assignats took place, this prosperity would necessarily collapse and be succeeded by a crisis all the more destructive, the more deeply men had engaged in speculation under the influence of the first favorable prospects. Thus came a collapse in manufacturing and commerce just as it had come previously in France, just as it came at various periods in Austria, Russia, America, 
and in all countries where men have tried to build up prosperity on irredeemable paper. All this breaking down of the manufacturers and commerce of the nation made fearful inroads on the greater fortunes. But upon the lesser and upon the little properties of the masses of the nation who relied upon their labor, it pressed with intense severity. The capitalist could put his surplus paper money into the government lands and await results. But the men who needed their money from day to day suffered the worst of the misery. Still another difficulty appeared. There had come a complete uncertainty as to the future. Long before the close of 1791, no one knew whether a piece of paper money representing a hundred livres would a month later have a purchasing power of 90 or 80 or 60 livres. The result was that capitalists feared to embark their means in business. Enterprise received a mortal blow. Demand for labor was still further diminished, and here came a new cause of calamity. For this uncertainty withered all far-reaching undertakings. The business of France dwindled into a mere living from hand to hand. This state of things, too, while it bore heavily upon the money classes, was still more ruinous to those in moderate, and most of all to those in straitened circumstances. With the masses of people, the purchase of every article of supply became a speculation. A speculation in which the professional speculator had an immense advantage over the ordinary buyer. Says the most brilliant of apologists for French revolutionary statesmanship, quote, Commerce was dead. Betting took its place. And surely we can find all of that very familiar to our current circumstances, say I. Nor was there any compensating advantage to the mercantile classes. The merchant was forced to add to his ordinary profit a sum sufficient to cover probable or possible fluctuations in value. While the prices of products thus went higher, the wages of labor, owing to the number of workmen who were thrown out of employment, went lower. But these evils, though great, were small compared to those far more deep-seated signs of disease which now showed themselves throughout the country. One of these was the obliteration of thrift from the minds of the French people. And, by the by, this is why the savings rates in the United States have gone down so catastrophically over the past few decades. To continue. The French are naturally thrifty, but with such masses of money and with such uncertainty as to its future value, the ordinary motives for saving and care diminished, and a loose luxury spread throughout the country. A still worse outgrowth was the increase of speculation and gambling. With the plethora of paper currency in 1791 appeared the first evidences of that cancerous disease which always follows large issues of irredeemable currency, a disease more permanently injurious to a nation than war, pestilence, or famine. For at the great metropolitan centers grew a luxurious, speculative, stock-gambling body, which, like a malignant tumor, absorbed into itself the strength of the nation and sent out its cancerous fibers to the remotest hamlets. At these city centers, abundant wealth seemed to be piled up. In the country at large, there grew a dislike of steady labor and a contempt for moderate gains and simple living. In a pamphlet published in May 1791, we see how, in regard to this also, public opinion was blinded. The author calls attention to this increase of gambling in values, of all sorts, in these words. What shall I say of the stock jobbing, as frightful as it is scandalous, which goes on in Paris under the very eyes of our legislators? A most terrible evil, yet, under the present circumstances, necessary? The author also speaks of these stock gamblers as using the most insidious means to influence public opinion in favor of their measures, and then proposes, seriously, a change in various matters of detail, thinking that this would prove a sufficient remedy for an evil which had its roots far down in the whole system of irredeemable currency. As well might a physician prescribe a pimple wash for a diseased liver. And again, don't think any comment needs to be made about how similar this is to modern Wall Street. Now began to be seen more plainly some of the many ways in which an inflation policy robs the working class. 
as these knots of plotting schemers at the city centres were becoming bloated with sudden wealth. The producing classes of the country, though having in their possession more and more currency, grew lean. In the schemes and speculations put forth by stock jobbers and stimulated by the printing of more currency, multitudes of small fortunes were absorbed and lost, while a few swollen fortunes were rapidly aggregated in the larger cities. This crippled a large class in the country districts which had employed a great number of workmen. In the leading French cities now arose a luxury and a license, which was a greater evil even than the plundering which ministered to it. In the country the gambling spirit spread more and more, says the same thoughtful historian whom I have already quoted. What a prospect for a country when its rural population was changed into a great band of gamblers. Nor was this reckless and corrupt spirit confined to businessmen. It began to break out in official circles, and public men who a few years before had been thought above all possibility of taint became luxurious, reckless, cynical, and finally corrupt. Mirabeau himself, who not many months previous had risked imprisonment and even death to establish constitutional government, was now, at this very time, secretly receiving heavy bribes. When, at the downfall of the monarchy a few years later, the famous iron chest of the Tuileries was opened, there were found evidences that, in this carnival of inflation and corruption, he had been a regularly paid servant of the royal court. The artful plundering of the people at large was bad enough, but worse still was this growing corruption in official and legislative circles. Out of the speculating and gambling of the inflation period grew luxury, and out of this, corruption. It grew as naturally as fungus on a muck heap. It was first felt in business operations, but soon began to be seen in the legislative body and in journalism. We can all see this with uh, Enron and Worldcom and all these other things, just by the by, to continue. Mirabeau was by no means the only example. Such members of the legislative body as Julien of Toulouse, Delaunay of Angre, Fabre de Alagantine, and their disciples were among the most noxious of those conspiring by legislative action to raise and depress securities for stock jobbing purposes. Bribery of legislators followed as a matter of course. Delaunay, Julien, and Chabot accepted a bribe of 500,000 livres for aging legislation calculated to promote the purposes of certain stock jobbers. It is some comfort to know that nearly all concerned were guillotined for it. It is true that the number of these corrupt legislators was small, far less than alarmists led the nation to suppose. But there were enough to cause widespread distrust, cynicism, and want of faith in any patriotism or any virtue. Even worse than this was the breaking down of the morals of the country at large, resulting from the sudden building up of ostentatious wealth in a few large cities, and from the gambling speculative spirit spreading from these to the small towns and rural districts. From this was developed an even more disgraceful result, the decay of a true sense of national good faith. The patriotism which the fear of the absolute monarchy, the machinations of the court party, the menaces of the army, and the threats of all monarchical Europe had been unable to shake, was gradually disintegrated by this same speculative stock-jobbing habit fostered by the superabundant currency. At the outset, in the discussions preliminary to the first issue of paper money, Mirabeau and others who had favoured it had insisted that patriotism, as well as an enlightened self-interest, would lead the people to keep up the value of paper money. The very opposite of this was now revealed, for there appeared, as another outgrowth of this disease, what has always been seen under similar circumstances. It is a result of previous and a cause of future evils. This outgrowth was a vast debtor class in the nation, directly interested in the depreciation of the currency in which they were to pay their debts. 
The nucleus of this class was formed by those who had purchased the church lands from the government. And just to interrupt, then, as in now, it shows up in the realm of real estate. To continue. Only small payments down had been required, and the remainder was to be paid in deferred installments. An indebtedness of a multitude of people had thus been created to the amount of hundreds of millions. This body of debtors soon saw, of course, that their interest was to depreciate the currency in which their debts were to be paid, and these were speedily joined by a far more influential class, by that class whose speculative tendencies had been stimulated by the abundance of paper money, and who had gone largely into debt, looking for a rise in nominal values. Soon, demagogues of the viler sort in the political clubs began to pander to it. A little later, important persons in this debtor class were to be found intriguing in the assembly, first in its seats and later in more conspicuous places of public trust. Before long, the debtor class became a powerful body, extending through all ranks of society. From the stock gambler who sat in the assembly, to the small land speculator in the rural districts, from the sleek inventor of canards on the Paris exchange, to the lying stock jobber in the market town, all pressed vigorously for new issues of paper. All were apparently able to demonstrate to the people that in new issues of paper lay the only chance for national prosperity. This great debtor class, relying on the multitude who could be approached by superficial arguments, soon gained control. Strange as it might seem to those who have not watched the same causes at work at a previous period in France and at various times in other countries, while every issue of paper money really made matters worse, a superstition gained ground among the people at large that if only enough paper money were issued and were more cunningly handled, the poor would be made rich. Henceforth, all opposition was futile. In December 1791, a report was made in the Legislative Assembly in favor of yet another great issue of 300 millions more of paper money. In regard to this report, Cambon said that more money was needed, but asked, quote, Will you, in a moment when stock jobbing is carried on with such fury, give it new power by adding so much more to the circulation? But such high considerations were now little regarded. Dorissy declared, There is not enough money yet in circulation. If there were more, the sales of national lands would be more rapid. And the official report of his speech states that these words were applauded. Dorissy then went on to insist that the government lands were worth at least 3,500 million livres, and said, quote, Why should members ascend the tribunal and disquiet France? Fear nothing. Your currency reposes upon a sound mortgage. Then followed a glorification of the patriotism of the French Republic, which he asserted would carry the nation through all its difficulties. Berquet, speaking next, declared that the circulation is becoming more rare every day. On December the 17th, 1791, a new issue was ordered, making in all 2,100 millions authorized. Coupled with this was the declaration that the total amount in actual circulation should never reach more than 1,600 millions. Before this issue, the value of the 100 livres note had fallen at Paris to about 80 livres. Immediately afterward, it fell to about 68 livres. What limitations of the currency were worth may be judged from the fact that not only had the declaration made hardly a year before limiting the amount in circulation to 1,200 millions been violated, but in the declaration made hardly a month previous in which the assembly had as solemnly limited the amount of circulation to 1,400 millions had also been repudiated. The evils which we have already seen arising from the earlier issues were now aggravated. But the most curious thing evolved out of all of this chaos, which was a new system of political economy. 
In speeches, newspapers and pamphlets about this time, we begin to find it declared that after all, a depreciated currency is a blessing. That gold and silver form an unsatisfactory standard for measuring values. That it is a good thing to have a currency that will not go out of the kingdom and which separates France from other nations. That thus shall manufacturers be encouraged. That commerce with other nations may be a curse and hindrance there too may be a blessing. That the laws of political economy, however applicable in other times, are not applicable to this particular period, and however operative in other nations, are not now so in France. That the ordinary rules of political economy are perhaps suited to the minions of despotism, but not to the free and enlightened inhabitants of France at the close of the 18th century. That the whole state of present things, so far from bringing an evil, is a blessing. All these ideas, and others quite as striking, were brought to the surface in the debates on the various new issues. And, by the by, this conforms to a theory that I have, which is that uh, what is called morality or virtue is invented after a crime to cover it up. To continue. Within four months came another report to the Assembly as ingenious as those preceding. It declared... Your committee are thoroughly persuaded that the amount of the circulating medium before the revolution was greater than that of the assignats today. But at that time the money circulated slowly, and now it passes rapidly so that 1,000 million assignats do the work of 2,000 millions of species. The report foretells further increases in prices, but by some curious jugglery reaches a conclusion favorable to further inflation. Despite these encouragements, the assignats nominally worth 100 livres had fallen at the beginning of February 1792 to about 60 livres, and during that month fell to 53 livres. In March, Clavier became Minister of Finance. He was especially proud of his share in the invention and advocacy of the assignats and now pressed their creation more vigorously than ever, and on April the 30th of the same year came a fifth great issue of paper money amounting to 300 millions. At about the same time, Cambon sneered ominously at public creditors as rich people, old financiers, and bankers. Soon payment was suspended on dues to public creditors for all amounts exceeding 10,000 francs. This is people who've lent money to the government. To continue. This was hailed by many as a measure in the interests of the poorer classes of people. But the result was that it injured them most of all. Henceforward, until the end of this history, capital was quietly taken from labor and locked up in all the ways that financial ingenuity could devise. All that saved thousands of laborers in France from starvation was that they were drafted off into the army and sent to be killed on foreign battlefields. The parallels to modern Iraq and Afghanistan are clear. To continue, on the last day of July 1792 came another brilliant report from Fouquet showing that the total amount of currency already issued was about 2,400 millions, but claiming that the national lands were worth a little more than this sum. A decree was now passed issuing 300 millions more. By this, the prices of everything were again enhanced, save one thing, and that one thing was... labor. Strange as it may first appear, while the depreciation of the currency had raised all products enormously in price, the stoppage of so many manufactories and the withdrawal of capital caused wages in the summer of 1792, after all the inflation, to be as small as they had been four years before, about 15 sous per day. I think a sou is one twentieth of a franc. It's very small. No more striking example can be seen of the truth uttered by Daniel Webster that, of all the contrivances for cheating the laboring classes of mankind, None has been more effective than that which deludes them with paper money. Issue after issue followed at intervals of a few months, until on December the 14th, 1792, we have an official statement to the effect that 3,500 millions had been put forth, of which 600 millions had been burned 
leaving in circulation 2,800 millions. When it is remembered that there was little business to do, and that the purchasing power of the livre, or franc, when judged by the staple products of the country, was equal to about half the present purchasing power of her own dollar, it will be seen into what evils France had drifted. As the mania for paper money ran its course, even the sou, obtained by melting down the church bells, were more and more driven out of circulation, and more and more parchment notes from 24 to 5 were issued. And at last, pieces of one sou, or half a sou, and even one quarter of a sou, were put into circulation. But now, another source of wealth was opened to the nation. There came a confiscation of the large estates of landed proprietors who had fled the country. An estimate in 1793 made the value of these estates three billions of francs. As a consequence, the issues of paper money were continued in increased amounts, on the old theory that they were guaranteed by the solemn pledge of these lands belonging to the state. Under the Legislative Assembly, through the year 1792, new issues were made virtually every month, so that at the end of January 1793, it was more and more realized that the paper money actually in circulation amounted close to upon 3,000 millions of francs. All this had been issued publicly in open sessions of the National and Legislative Assemblies, but now, under the National Convention, the two committees of public safety and of finance began to decree new issues privately, in secret session. The modern equivalent of this is the Federal Reserve, which no longer tells anyone how much money it's printing. To continue. As a result of this secrecy, the issues became larger still, and 400 workmen were added to those previously engaged in furnishing this paper money. And these were so pressed with work from 6 o'clock in the morning until 8 in the evening that they struck for higher wages and were successful. The consequences of these over-issues now began to be more painfully evident to the people at large. Articles of common consumption became enormously expensive and prices were constantly rising. Orators in the legislative assembly, clubs, local meetings and elsewhere now endeavoured to enlighten people by assigning every reason for this depreciation save the true one. They declaimed against the corruption of the ministry, the want of patriotism among the moderates, the intrigues of the emigrant nobles, the hard-heartedness of the rich, the monopolizing spirit of the merchants, the perversity of the shopkeepers, each and all of these as causes of difficulty. Just to interrupt, when the economy begins to collapse, you need much better orators to distract the people, which is why we now have Barack Obama instead of George Bush, but to continue. This decline in the government paper was at first somewhat masked by fluctuations, for at various times the value of the currency rose. The victory of Jean Map and the general success of the French army against the invaders, with the additional security offered by new confiscations of land caused in November 1792, an appreciation in the value of the currency. The franc had stood at 57 and it rose to about 69. But the downward tendency was soon resumed, and in September 1793 the assignats had sunk below 30. Then sundry new victories and coruscations of oratory gave momentary confidence so that in December 1793 they rose above 50. But despite these fluctuations, the downward tendency soon became more rapid than ever. The washerwomen of Paris, finding soap so expensive that they could hardly purchase it, insisted that all the merchants who were endeavouring to save something of their little property by refusing to sell their goods for the wretched currency with which France was flooded should be punished with death. The women of the markets and the hangers-on of the Jacobin Club called loudly for a law to equalise the value of paper money and silver coin. It was also demanded that a tax be laid especially on the rich to the amount of 400 million francs to buy bread. Merat declared loudly that the people, by hanging shopkeepers and plundering stores, could easily remove the trouble. The result was that, on the 28th of February, 1793, at 8 o'clock in the evening, a mob of men and women in disguise began plundering the stores and shops of Paris. 
At first, they demanded only bread. Soon, they insisted on coffee and rice and sugar. At last, they seized everything on which they could lay their hands. Cloth, clothing, groceries, and luxuries of every kind. Two hundred such stores were plundered. This was endured for six hours, and finally order was restored only by a grant of seven million francs to buy off the mob. The new political economy was beginning to bear its fruits luxuriantly. A gaudy growth of it appeared in the city hall of Paris when, in response to the complaints of the plundered merchants, Rue declared in the midst of great applause that shopkeepers were only giving back to the people what they had hitherto robbed them of. The mob, having been thus bought off by concessions and appeased by oratory, the government gained time to think. And now came a series of amazing expedients, and yet all perfectly logical. Uh, Just to interrupt, this is one of the reasons why statism in a quasi-free market economy is so dangerous, because you have the capitalist class, the shopkeeper class, and even the banking classes, which is the people that the general mob actually interacts with. So when inflation caused by central government overprinting of money hits the store, the shopkeeper is the one who appears bad to the customer because it appears that the shopkeeper is raising his prices when in fact it's the government. And so what happens is because people deal with the immediate rather than the theoretical and generally they get mad at the shopkeepers and demand more power for the government, which is the cause of their problems to begin with, uh, which is a very, very important aspect of why statism does not work. So these are the amazing expedients we will continue that the government comes up with. Three of these have gained in French history an evil preeminence, and the first of the three was the forced loan. In view of the fact that the well-to-do citizens were thought to be lukewarm in their support of the politicians controlling the country, various demagogues in the National Convention, which had now succeeded the National Constituent and Legislative Assemblies, found ample matter for denunciations long and hard. The result outside the convention was increased activity of the guillotine. The results inside were new measures against all who had money. And on June the 22nd, 1793, the convention determined that there should be a forced loan, secured on the confiscated lands of the emigrants and levied upon all married men with incomes of 10,000 francs and upon all unmarried men with incomes of 6,000 francs. It was calculated that these would bring into the treasury a thousand millions of francs. Alas, a difficulty was found. So many of the rich had fled or had concealed their wealth that only a fifth of the sum required could be raised, and therefore a law was soon passed which levied forced loans upon incomes as low as 1,000 francs, or say $200 of American money. This tax was made progressive. On the smaller proprietors, it was fixed at one-tenth And on the larger, that is, in all incomes above 9,000 francs, it was made one half of the entire income. Little, if any, provision was made for the repayment of this, quote, loan, but the certificates might be used for purchasing the confiscated real estate of the church and of the nobility. But if this first expedient shows how naturally a fiat money system runs into despotism, The next is no less instructive in showing how easily it becomes repudiation and dishonor. As we have seen, the first issue of the Assignats made by the National Assembly bore a portrait of the king. But on the various issues after the establishment of a republic, this emblem had been discarded. This change led to a difference in value between the earlier and the later paper money. The wild follies of fanatics and demagogues had led to an increasing belief that the existing state of things could not last, that the Bourbons, the monarchy, must ere long return, that in such case, while a new monarch would repudiate all the vast mass of the later paper issued by the Republic, he would recognize that first issue bearing the face, and therefore the guarantee, of the king. So it was that this first issue came to bear a higher value than those of a later date. To meet this condition of things, it was now proposed to repudiate all that earlier issue. In vain did sundry more thoughtful members of the convention plead that this paper money amounting to 558 millions of francs 
bore the solemn guarantee of the nation as well as of the king. The current was irresistible. All that Cambon, the great leader of finance at the time, could secure was a clause claiming to protect the poor to the effect that this demonetization should not exceed or extend to notes below a hundred francs in value. And it was also agreed that any of the notes, large or small, might be received in payment of taxes and for the confiscated property of the clergy and nobility. To all the arguments advanced against this breach of the national faith, Danton, then at the height of his power, simply declared that only aristocrats could favor notes bearing the royal portrait, and gave forth his famous utterance. Imitate nature which watches over the preservations of the race, but has no regard for individuals. I don't know what that means. Let's continue. The decree was passed on the 31st of July, 1793, yet its futility was apparent in less than two months when the convention decreed that there should be issued 2,000 millions of francs more in assignats between the values of 10 sous and 400 francs, and when, before the end of the year, 500 millions more were authorized. The third outgrowth of the vast issue of fiat money was the maximum. As far back as November 1792, the terrorist associate of Robespierre Saint-Just, in view of the steady rise in prices of the necessaries of life, had proposed a scheme by which these prices should be established by law, at a rate proportionate to the wages of the working classes. This plan lingered in men's minds, taking shape in various resolutions and decrees, until the whole culminated on September 29, 1793, in the law of the maximum, and what this means, just by the by, is price capping, right? You can't charge more than X amount of dollars, which will inevitably result in shortages and so on. So we can continue. While all this legislation was high-handed, it was not careless. Even statesmen of the greatest strength, having once been drawn into this flood, were borne on into excesses which, a little earlier, would have appalled them. Committees of experts were appointed to study the whole subject of prices, and at last there were adopted the great four rules, which seemed to statesmen of that time a masterly solution of the whole difficulty. First, the price of each article of necessity was to be fixed at one and one-third its price in 1790. Secondly, all transportation was to be added at a fixed rate per league. Thirdly, 5% was to be added for the profit of the wholesaler. Fourthly, 10% was to be added for the profit of the retailer. Nothing could look more reasonable. Great was the jubilation. The report was presented and supported by Barère, the tiger monkey, then in all the glory of his great orations, now best known from his portrait by Macaulay. Nothing could withstand Barère's eloquence, he insisted that France had been suffering from a monarchical commerce which only sought wealth, while what she needed, and what she was now to receive, was a republican commerce, a commerce of moderate profits, and virtuous. He exulted in the fact that France alone enjoys such a commerce that it exists in no other nation. He poured contempt over political economy as that science which quacks have corrupted which pedants have obscured, and which academics have depreciated. France, he said, has something better, and he declared in conclusion, the needs of the people will no longer be spied upon in order that the commercial classes may arbitrarily take advantage. This is what the government always does. The producer is your enemy. The guy with the gun in the state is your friend. To continue, the first result of the maximum was that every means was taken to evade the fixed price imposed, and the farmers brought in as little produce as they possibly could. This increased the scarcity, and the people of the large cities were put on an allowance. Tickets were issued authorizing the bearer to obtain at the official prices a certain amount of bread or sugar or soap or wood or coal to cover immediate necessities. 
but it was found that the maximum, with its divinely revealed four rules, could not be made to work well, even by the shrewdest devices. In the greater part of France, it could not be enforced. As to merchandise of foreign origin, or merchandise into which any foreign product entered, the war had raised it far above the price allowed under the first rule, namely the prices of 1790, with the addition of one-third. Shopkeepers, therefore, could not sell such goods without ruin. The result was that very many went out of business, and the remainder forced buyers to pay enormous charges under the very natural excuse that the seller risked his life in trading at all. That this excuse was valid is easily seen by the daily lists of those condemned to the guillotine, in which, not infrequently, figure the names of men charged with violating the maximum laws. Manufacturers were very generally crippled and frequently destroyed, and agriculture was fearfully depressed. To detect goods concealed by farmers and shopkeepers, a spy system was established with a reward to the informer of one-third of the value of the goods discovered. To spread terror, the criminal tribunal at Strasbourg was ordered to destroy the dwelling of anyone found guilty of selling goods above the price set by law. The farmer often found that he could not raise his products at anything like the price required by the new law, and when he tried to hold back his crops or cattle, alleging that he could not afford to sell them at the prices fixed by law, they were frequently taken from him by force, and he was fortunate if paid even in the depreciated fiat money, fortunate indeed, if he finally escaped with his life. Involved in all these perplexities, the convention tried to cut the Gordian knot. It decreed that any person selling gold or silver coin or making any difference in any transaction between paper and specie should be imprisoned in irons for six years. That anyone who refused to accept a payment in assignats or accepted assignats at a discount should pay a fine of 3,000 francs. And that anyone committing this crime a second time should pay a fine of 6,000 francs and suffer imprisonment 20 years in irons. Later, on the 8th of September 1793, the penalty for such offences was made death, with confiscation of the criminal's property and a reward was offered to any person informing the authorities regarding any such criminal transactions. To reach the climax of ferocity, the convention decreed in May 1794 that the death penalty should be inflicted on any person convicted of, quote, having asked before a bargain was concluded in what money payment was to be made. Nor was this all. The great finance minister, Cambon, soon saw that the worst enemies of his policy were gold and silver. Therefore it was that under his lead, the convention closed the exchange, and finally on November 13, 1793, under terrifying penalties, suppressed all commerce in the precious metals. About a year later came the abolition of the maximum itself. It is easily seen that these maximum laws were perfectly logical. Whenever any nation entrusts to its legislators the issue of a currency not based on the idea of redemption in standard coin recognized in the commerce of civilized nations, it entrusts to them the power to raise or depress the value of every article in the possession of every citizen. Louis XIV had claimed that all property in France was his own, and that what private persons held was as much his as if it were in his coffers. But even this assumption is exceeded by the confiscating power exercised in a country where instead of leaving values to be measured by a standard common to the whole world, they are left to be depressed or raised at the whim, caprice or interest of a body of legislators. When this power is given, the power of fixing prices is inevitably included in it. Of course, this is why you didn't get minimum wages until after fiat currency was adopted in the United States, or inflicted. To continue. It may be said that these measures were made necessary by the war then going on. Nothing could be more baseless than such an objection. In this war, the French soon became generally successful. It was quickly pushed mainly upon foreign soil. 
numerous contributions were levied upon the subjugated countries to support the French armies. The war was one of those in which the loss, falling apparently on future generations, first stimulates, in a sad way, trade and production. The main cause of these evils was tampering with the circulating medium of an entire nation. Keeping all values in fluctuation, discouraging enterprise, paralyzing energy, undermining sobriety, obliterating thrift, promoting extravagance and exciting riot by the issue of an irredeemable currency. The true business way of meeting the enormous demands on France during the first years of the revolution had been stated by a true statesman and sound financier, Dupont de Nemours, at the very beginning. He had shown that using the same paper as a circulating medium and as a means for selling the national real estate it was like using the same implement for an oyster knife and a razor. It has been argued that the assignats sank in value because they were not well secured, that securing them on government real estate was as futile as if the United States had, in the financial troubles of its early days, secured notes on its real estate. This objection is utterly fallacious. The government lands of our country, the United States, were remote from the centers of capital and difficult to examine. The French national real estate was near these centers, even in them, and easy to examine. Our national real estate was unimproved and unproductive. Theirs was improved and productive. Its average productiveness in market in ordinary times being from 4 to 5 percent. It has also been objected that the attempt to secure the assignats on government real estate failed because of the general want of confidence in the title derived by the purchases from the new government. Every thorough student of that period must know that this is a misleading statement. Everything shows that the vast majority of the French people had a fanatical confidence in the stability of the new government during the greater part of the revolution. There were disbelievers in the security of the assignats, just as there were disbelievers in the paper money of the United States throughout our civil war, but they were usually a small minority. Even granting that there was a doubt as to investment in French lands, the French people certainly had as much confidence in the secure possession of government lands as any people can ever have in large issues of government bonds. Indeed, it is certain that they had far more confidence in their lands as a security than modern nations can usually have in large issues of bonds obtained by payments of irredeemable paper. One simple fact, as stated by John Stuart Mill, which made assignats difficult to convert into real estate, was that the vast majority of people could not afford to make investments outside their business. And this fact is no less fatal to any attempt to contract large issues of irredeemable paper, save perhaps a bold statesmanlike attempt, which seizes the best time and presses every advantage, eschewing all juggling devices and sacrificing everything to maintain a sound currency, based on standards common to the entire financial world. And now was seen taking possession of the nation. That idea which developed so easily out of the fiat money system. The idea that the ordinary needs of government may be legitimately met wholly by the means of paper currency. That taxes may be dispensed with. As a result, it was found that the assignat printing press was the one resource left to the government. And the increase in the volume of paper money became every day more appalling. It will doubtless surprise many to learn that in spite of these evident results of too much currency, the old cry of a scarcity of circulating medium was not stilled. It appeared not long after each issue, no matter how large. But every thoughtful student of financial history knows that this cry always comes after such issues. Nay, that it must come because in obedience to a natural law, the former scarcity, or rather insufficiency of currency, recurs just as soon as prices become adjusted to the new volume, and there comes some little revival of business with the usual increase of credit. So, because the new issues are not creating any real wealth, it does seem that we're short of currency, because the currency immediately becomes depreciated. That's what he's saying here. To continue... In August 1793 appeared a new report by Cambon, 
no one can read it without being struck by its mingled ability and folly. His final plan of dealing with the public debt has outlasted all revolutions since. But his disposition of the inflated currency came to a wretched failure. Against Dupont, who showed conclusively that the wild increase of paper money was leading straight to ruin, Cambon carried the majority in the great assemblies and clubs by sheer audacity. The audacity of desperation. Zeal in supporting the assignats became his religion. The National Convention that succeeded the Legislative Assembly issued, in 1793, over 3,000 millions of assignats. And of these, over 1,200 millions were poured into the circulation. And yet, Cambon steadily insisted that the security for the assignat currency was perfect. The climax of his zeal was reached when he counted as assets in the national treasury the indemnities which, he declared, France was sure to receive after future victories over the Allied nations, with which she was then waging a desperate war. As patriotism, it was sublime. As finance, it was deadly. Everything was tried. Very elaborately, he devised a funding scheme which, taken in connection with his system of issues, was in effect what in these days would be called an intraconvertibility scheme. By various degrees of persuasion, or force, the guillotine looming up in the background, holders of assignats were urged to convert them into evidence of national debt, bearing interest at 5%, with the understanding that if more paper were afterward needed, more would be issued. All in vain. The official tables of depreciation show that the assignats continued to fall. A forced loan calling in a billion of these checked this fall, but only for a moment. The interconvertibility scheme between currency and bonds failed as dismally as the interconvertibility scheme between currency and land had failed. A more effective expedient was a law confiscating the property of all Frenchmen who left France after July 14, 1789, and who had not returned. This gave new land to be mortgaged for the security of paper money. All this vast chapter in financial folly is sometimes referred to as if it resulted from the direct action of men utterly unskilled in finance. This is a grave error. That wild schemers and dreamers took a leading part in setting the fiat money system going is true. That speculation and interested financiers made it worse is also true. But the men who had charge of French finance during the reign of terror, and who made these experiments, which seemed to us so monstrous, in order to rescue themselves and their country from the flood which was sweeping everything to financial ruin, were universally recognized as among the most skillful and honest financiers in Europe. Cambon especially ranked then, and ranks now, as among the most expert in any period. The disastrous results of all his courage and ability in the attempt to stand against the deluge of paper money show how powerless are the most skilled and skillful masters of finance to stem the tide of fiat money calamity when once it is fairly under headway, and how useless are all enactments which they can devise against the underlying laws of nature. Month after month, year after year, new issues went on. Meanwhile, everything possible was done to keep up the value of money. The city authorities of Metz took a solemn oath that the assignats should bear the same price, whether in paper or specie, and whether in buying or selling, and various other official bodies throughout the nation followed this example. In obedience to those who believed with the market women of Paris, as stated in their famous petition, that laws should be passed making paper money as good as gold. Couthon, in August 1793, had proposed and carried a law punishing any persons who should sell assignat at less than their nominal value with imprisonment for 20 years in chains, and later carried a law making investments in foreign countries by Frenchmen punishable with death. But to the surprise of the great majority of the French people, the value of 
The assignats was found, after the momentary spasm of fear had passed, not to have been permanently increased by these measures. On the contrary, this fiat paper persisted in obeying the natural laws of finance, and as new issues increased, their value decreased. Nor did the most lavish aid of nature avail. The paper money of the nation seemed to possess a magic power to transmute prosperity into adversity and plenty, into famine. The year 1794 was exceptionally fruitful, and yet with the autumn came scarcity of provisions, and with the winter came distress. The reason is perfectly simple. The sequences in that whole history are absolutely logical. First, the assembly had inflated the currency and raised prices enormously. Next, it had been forced to establish an arbitrary maximum price for produce. But this price, large as it seemed, soon fell below the real value of produce. Many of the farmers, therefore, raised less produce or refrained from bringing what they had to market. But as is usual in such cases, the trouble was ascribed to everything but the real cause and the most severe measures were established in all parts of the country to force farmers to bring produce to market, millers to grind, and shopkeepers to sell it. The issues of paper money continued. Toward the end of 1794, 7,000 millions in assignats were in circulation. By the end of May 1795, the circulation was increased to 10,000 millions. The end of July, to 14,000 millions and the value of 100 francs in paper fell steadily, first to 4 francs in gold, then to 3, then to 2.5. But curiously enough, while this depreciation was rapidly going on, as at various other periods when depreciation was rapid, there came an apparent revival of business. The hopes of many were revived by the fact that in spite of the decline of paper, there was an exceedingly brisk trade in all kinds of permanent property, Whatever articles of permanent value certain needy people were willing to sell, certain cunning people were willing to buy, and to pay good prices for in assignats. At this, hope revived for a time in certain quarters. But before long it was discovered that this was one of the most distressing results of a natural law which is sure to come into play under such circumstances. It was simply a feverish activity caused by the intense desire of a large number of the shrewder classes to convert their paper money into anything and everything which they could hold and hoard until the collapse which they foresaw should take place. This very activity in business simply indicated the disease. It was simply legal robbery of the more enthusiastic and trusting by the more cold-hearted and keen. It was the unloading of the assignats upon the mass of the people. Interesting it is to note, in the midst of all this, the steady action of another simple law in finances. Prisons, guillotines, enactments inflicting twenty years' imprisonment in chains upon persons twice convicted of buying or selling paper money at less than its normal value, and death upon investors in foreign securities, were powerless. The National Convention fighting a world in arms and with an armed revolt on its own soil showed titanic power, but in its struggle to circumvent one simple law of nature, its weakness was pitiable. The Louis d'Or stood in the market as a monitor, noting each day with unerring fidelity the decline in the value of the assignat. This is a gold coin. A monitor not to be bribed, not to be scared. As well might the National Convention try to bribe or scare away the polarity of the Marinus Compass. On August 1st, 1795, this gold louis of 25 francs was worth, in paper, 920 francs. September 1st, 1,200 francs. November 1st, 2,600 francs. December 1st, 3,050. In February 1796, It was worth 7,200 francs, or one franc in gold was worth 288 francs in paper. Prices of all commodities went up nearly in proportion. The writings of this period give curious details. 
Thibaudot, in his memoirs, speaks of sugar as 500 francs a pound. Soap, 230 francs. Candles, 140 francs. Mercier, in his lifelike picture of the French metropolis at that period, mentions 600 francs as carriage hire for a single drive and 6,000 for an entire day. Examples from other sources are such as the following. A measure of flour advanced from 2 francs in 1790 to 225 francs in 1795. A pair of shoes from 5 francs to 200. A hat from 14 francs to 500. Butter to 580 francs a pound. A turkey to 900 francs. Everything was enormously inflated in price except the wages of labor. As manufacturers had closed, wages had fallen until all that kept them up seemed to be the fact that so many laborers were drafted off into the army. From this state of things came grievous wrong and gross fraud. Men who had foreseen these results and had gone into debt were of course jubilant. He who in 1790 had borrowed 10,000 francs could repay his debts in 1796 for about 35 francs. Laws were made to meet these abuses. As far back as 1794, a plan was devised for publishing official tables of depreciation to be used in making equitable settlements of debts, but all such machinery proved futile. On the 18th of May, 1796, a young man complained to the National Convention that his elder brother, who had been acting as administrator of his deceased father's estate, had paid the heirs in assignats, and that he had received scarcely one three hundredth part of the real value of his share. To meet cases like this, a law was passed establishing a scale of proportion. Taking as a standard the value of the assignat when there were two billions in circulation, this law declared that in payment of debts, one quarter should be added to the amount originally borrowed for every five hundred millions added to the circulation. In obedience to this law, a man who borrowed 2,000 francs when there were 2 billions in circulation would have to pay his creditors 2,500 francs when half a billion more were added to the currency, and over 35,000 francs before the emissions of paper reached their final amount. This brought new evils, worse if possible, than the old. The question will naturally be asked. On whom did this vast depreciation mainly fall at last? When this currency had sunk to about one three hundredth part of its nominal value, and after that, to nothing, in whose hands was the bulk of it? The answer is simple. I shall give it in the exact words of that thoughtful historian from whom I have already quoted. Quote, Before the end of the year 1795, the paper money was almost exclusively in the hands of the working classes, employees, and men of small means, whose property was not large enough to invest in stores of goods or national lands. Financiers and men of large means were shrewd enough to put as much of their property as possible into objects of permanent value. The working classes had no such foresight or skill or means. On them, finally, came the great crushing weight of the loss. After the first collapse came up the cries of the starving. Roads and bridges were neglected. Many factories were given up in utter helplessness. To continue in the words of the historian already cited, none felt any confidence in the future in any respect. Few dared to make a business investment for any length of time, and it was accounted a folly to curtail the pleasures of the moment, to accumulate or save for so uncertain a future. This system in finance was accompanied by a system in politics no less startling, and each system tended to aggravate the other. The wild radicals, having sent to the guillotine first all the royalists, and next all the leading republicans they could entrap, the various factions began sending each other to the same destination. Ebertis, Dantonis, and with various other factions and groups, and finally the Robespierreists, following each other in rapid succession. After these declaimers and phrasemongers had thus disappeared, there came to power, in October 1795, a new government, 
mainly a survival of the more scoundrelly, the Directory. It found the country utterly impoverished, and its only resource at first was to print more paper and to issue even while wet from the press. These new issues were made at last by the two great committees, with or without warrant of law and in greater sums than ever. Complaints were made that the army of engravers and printers at the Mint could not meet the demand for assignats, that they could produce only from 60 to 70 millions per day, and that the government was spending daily from 80 to 90 millions. 4,000 millions of francs were issued during one month a little later, 3,000 millions a little later, 4,000 millions, until there had been put forth over 35,000 millions. The purchasing power of this paper having now become almost nothing, it was decreed on the 22nd of December 1795 that the whole amount issued should be limited to 40,000 millions, including all that had been previously set forth, and that, when this had been done, the copper plates should be broken. Even in spite of this, additional issues were made amounting to about 10,000 millions. But on the 18th of February, 1796, at nine o'clock in the morning, in the presence of a great crowd, the machinery, plates, and paper for printing assignats were brought to the Place Vendôme, and there, on the spot where the Napoleon Column now stands, these were solemnly broken and burned. Shortly afterward, a report by Camus was made to the Assembly that the entire amount of paper money issued in less than six years by the revolutionary government of France had been over 45,000 millions of francs, that over 6,000 millions had been annulled and burnt, and that at the final catastrophe there were in circulation close to 40,000 millions. It will be readily seen that it was fully time to put an end to the system. For the gold louis of 25 francs in specie had, in February 1796, as we have seen, become worth 7,200 francs. And, at the latest quotation of all, no less than 15,000 francs in paper money, that is, one franc in gold, was nominally worth 6,000 francs in paper. Such were the results of allowing dreamers, schemers, phrase-mongers, declaimers, and strongmen subservient to those to control a government. The first new expedient of the directory was to secure a forced loan of 600 million francs from the wealthier classes, but this was found fruitless. Ominous it was when persons compelled to take this loan found for an assignat of 100 francs, only one franc was allowed. Next, a national bank was proposed, but capitalists were loath to embark in banking, while the howls of the mob against all who had anything especially to do with money resounded in every city. At last, the directory bethought themselves of another expedient. This was by no means new. It had been fully tried on our continent twice before that time, and once since, first in our colonial period, next during our confederation, lastly by the Southern Confederacy, and here, as elsewhere, always in vain. But experience yielded to theory, plain business sense, to financial metaphysics. It was determined to issue a new paper, which should be fully secured and as good as gold. Pursuant to this decision, it was decreed that a new paper money, fully secured and as good as gold, be issued under the name of Mandats. In order that, these new notes should be fully secured. Choice public real estate was set apart to an amount fully equal to the nominal value of the issue. And anyone offering any amount of the mandats could at once take possession of government lands. The price of the lands to be determined by two experts, one named by the government and one by the buyer, and without the formalities and delays previously established in regard to the purchase of lands with assignats. Perhaps the most whimsical thing in the whole situation was the fact that the government, pressed as it was by demands of all sorts, continued to issue the old assignats at the same time that it was discrediting them by issuing the new mandats. And yet in order to make the mandats as good as gold, it was planned by forced loans and other means to reduce the quantity of assignats in circulation. 
so that the value of each asinat should be raised to one thirtieth of the value of gold. Then, to make mandats legal tender and to substitute them for assignats at the rate of one for thirty. Never were great expectations more cruelly disappointed. Even before the mandats could be issued from the press, they fell to 35% of their nominal value. From this, they speedily fell to 15%, and soon after to 5%, and finally, in August 1796, six months from their first issue, to 3%. This plan failed. Just as it had failed in New England in 1737, just as it failed under our own confederation in 1781, just as it failed under the Southern Confederacy during our Civil War. This is just Steph jumping in to mention that one way that you know the, fa- the plan is going to fail is that they have an independent expert assigning the value of the price of land rather than supply and demand of the free market. To continue. To sustain this new currency, the government resorted to every method that ingenuity could devise. Pamphlets suited to people of every capacity were published explaining its advantages. Never was there more skillful puffing. A pamphlet signed Marchand and dedicated to people of good faith was widely circulated, in which Marchand took pains to show the great advantage of the mandats as compared to the assignats, how land could be more easily acquired with them, how their security was better than with assignats how they could not by any possibility sink in values as the assignats had done. But even before the pamphlet was dry from the press, the depreciation of the mandats had refuted his entire argument. The old plan of penal measures was again pressed. Monon led off by proposing penalties against those who shall speak publicly against the mandats. Tello thought the penalties ought to be made especially severe, and finally it was enacted that any persons, quote, who by their discourse or writing shall decry the mandats shall be condemned to a fine of not less than 1,000 francs or more than 10,000, and in the case of a repetition of the offence, to four years in irons. It was also decreed that those who refuse to receive the mandats should be fined, the first time the exact sum which they refuse, the second time ten times as much, and the third time punished with two years in prison. But here, too, came in the action of those natural laws which are alike inexorable in all countries. This attempt proved futile in France, just as it had proved futile less than 20 years before in America. No enactments could stop the downward tendency of this new paper, fully secured, as good as gold. The laws that finally govern finance are not made in conventions or congresses. Amen to that. From time to time, various new financial juggles were tried, some of them ingenious, most of them drastic. It was decreed that all assignats above the value of 100 francs should cease to circulate after the beginning of June 1796. But this only served to destroy the last vestige of confidence in government notes of any kind. Another expedient was seen in the decree that paper money should be made to accord with a natural and immutable standard of value and that one franc in paper should thenceforth be worth ten pounds of wheat. This also failed. On July 16th, another decree seemed to show that the authorities despaired of regulating the existing currency, and it was decreed that all paper, whether at mandats or assignats, should be taken at its real value, and that bargains might be made in whatever currency people chose. The real value of the mandats speedily sank to about 2% of their nominal value, and the only effect of this legislation seemed to be that both assignats and mandats went still lower. I must say, by the by, that the idea that you can threaten, bully, and use violence to create value in people is something, is a lie that is as old as mankind. Parents do it to children, priests do it to children, teachers do it to children, adults do it to adults, and adults do it to the elderly. The idea that the initiation of force can somehow create value is exactly what is going on here. Then, from February 4th to February 14th, 1797, came decrees and orders that the engraving apparatus for the mandats should be destroyed, as that for the assignats had been, and that neither assignats nor mandats should any longer be a legal tender. 
and that old debts to the state might be paid for a time with government paper at the rate of 1% of their face value. Then, less than three months later, it was decreed that the 21 billions of assignats still in circulation should be annulled. Finally, on September 30th, 1797, as the culmination of these and various other experiments and expedients, came an order of the Directory that the national debt should be paid two-thirds in bonds which might be used in purchasing confiscated real estate and the remaining consolidated third, as it was called, was to be placed on the great book of the national debt to be paid thenceforth as the government should think best. And again, just to note, a currency in this case, this currency founded upon a theft of the state, cannot create value either. To continue. As to the bonds which the creditors of the nation were thus forced to take, they sank rapidly as the assignats and mandats had done, even to 3% of their value. As to the consolidated third, that was largely paid until the coming of Bonaparte in paper money, which sank gradually to about 6% of its faith value. Since May 1797, both assignats and mandats had been virtually worth nothing. And we find a 5% value shocking. 5% value as shocking, but... That's all that's left of the U.S. dollar from about 1913. So, shocking, but we've seen it. Well, <laughs> we've seen the tail end of it. To continue. So ended the reign of paper money in France. The 2,500 millions of mandats went into the common heap of refuse with the previous 45,000 millions of assignats. The nation, in general, rich and poor alike, was plunged into financial ruin from one end to the other. On the prices charged for articles of ordinary use, light is thrown by extracts from a table published in 1795, reduced to American coinage. For a bushel of flour, 1790, 40 cents. 1795, 45 dollars. Bushel of oats, 18 cents to $10, cart load of wood, $4 to $500, bushel of coal, 7 cents to $2, pound of sugar, 18 cents to $12.5, pound of soap, 18 cents to $8, pound of candles, 18 cents to $8, for one cabbage, 8 cents to $5.5, pair of shoes, $1 to $40, for 25 eggs, 24 cents to $5. But these prices about the middle of 1795 were moderate compared with those which were reached before the close of that year and during the year following. Perfectly authentic examples were such as the following. A pound of bread, $9. A bushel of potatoes, $40. A pound of candles, $40. A cartload of wood, $250. So a pound of candles, $17.90. $0.18, $17.95, eight dollars following year, $40. So much for the poorer people. Typical of those esteemed wealthy may be mentioned a manufacturer of hardware who, having retired from business in 1790 with 321,000 livres, found his property in 1796 worth 14,000 francs. For this general distress arising from the development and collapse of fiat money in France, there was indeed one exception. In Paris, and a few of the other great cities, men like Tallien, of the heartless, debauched, luxurious, speculator, contractor, and stock gambler class, had risen above the ruins of the multitudes of smaller fortunes. Tallien, one of the worst demagogue reformers, and a certain number of men like him had been skillful enough to become millionaires, while their dupes who had clamoured for issues of paper money had become paupers. The luxury and extravagance of the currency gamblers and their families form one of the most significant features in any picture of the social condition of that period. A few years before this, the leading woman in French society showed a nobility of character and a simplicity in dress worthy of Roman matrons. Of these were Madame Rollin and Madame Desmoulins, 
But now all was changed. At the head of society stood Madame Tallien, and others like her, wild in extravagance, daily seeking new refinements in luxury, and demanding of their husbands and lovers vast sums to array them and to feed their whims. If such sums could not be had honestly, then they must be gotten dishonestly. The more closely one examines that period, the more clearly he sees that the pictures given by Thibaudeau and Chalamin and de Goncourt are not at all exaggerated. The contrast between these gay creatures of the directory period and the people at large was striking. Indeed, much as the vast majority of the wealthy classes suffered from impoverishment, the laboring classes, salaried employees of all sorts and people of fixed income and of small means, especially in the cities, underwent yet greater distress. These were found, as a rule, to subsist mainly on daily government rations of bread at the rate of one pound per person. This was frequently unfit for food and was distributed to long lines of people, men, women and children, who were at times obliged to wait their turn even from dawn till dusk. The very rich could, by various means, especially by bribery, obtain better bread, but only at enormous cost. In May 1796, the market price of good bread was, in paper, 80 francs, $16 per pound, and a little later provisions could not be bought for paper money at any price. And here it may be worth mentioning that there was another financial trouble especially vexatious. While, as we have seen, such enormous sums rising from 20 to 40 thousands millions of francs in paper were put in circulation by the successive governments of the revolution, enormous sums had been set afloat in counterfeits by criminals and by the enemies of France. These came not only from various parts of the French Republic, but from nearly all the surrounding nations, the main source being London. Thence it was that Count Joseph de Bossuay sent off cargoes of false paper, excellently engraved and printed through ports in Brittany and other disaffected parts of France. One seizure by General Hoch was declared by him to exceed, in nominal value, 10,000 millions of francs. With the exceptions of a few of these issues, detection was exceedingly difficult even for experts. For the vast majority of the people it was impossible. Nor was this all. At various times, the insurgent royalists in Le Vendée and elsewhere put their presses also in operation, issuing notes bearing the Bourbon arms, the Fleur de Lis, the portrait of the Dauphin as Louis XVII, with the magic legend de Par de Roi, and large bodies of the population in the insurgent districts were forced to take these. Even as late as 1799, these notes continued to appear. The financial agony was prolonged somewhat by attempts to secure funds by still another forced loan and other discredited measures, but when all was over with paper money, specie, gold and silver and copper coins, began to reappear. First in sufficient sums to do the small amount of business which remained after the collapse. Then, as the business demand increased, the amount of specie flowed in from the world at large to meet it, and the nation gradually recovered from that long paper-money debauch. Thibaudot, a very thoughtful observer, tells us in his memoirs that great fears were felt as to a want of circulating medium between the time when paper should go out and coin should come in, but that no such want was severely felt, that coin came in gradually as it was wanted. Just wanted to mention that this is what happens when you stop using force, right? the market supply even of money, which is just a good and a service, fills in the gap as is necessary, and this would also be the case, of course, if public schools were shut down or anything else. To continue, nothing could better exemplify the saying of one of the most shrewd of modern statesmen that there will always be money. But though there soon came a degree of prosperity, as compared with the distress during the paper-money orgy, convalescence was slow. 
The acute suffering from the wreck and ruin brought by assignats, mandats, and other paper currency in process of repudiation lasted nearly ten years. But the period of recovery lasted longer than the generation which followed. It required fully forty years to bring capital, industry, commerce, and credit up to their condition when the revolution began, and demanded a man on horseback, this is a reference to Napoleon, who established monarchy on the ruins of the republic and threw away millions of lives for the empire to be added to the millions which had been sacrificed by the revolution. Such, briefly sketched in its leading features, is the history of the most skillful, vigorous, and persistent attempt ever made to substitute for natural laws in finance the ability of legislative bodies and for a standard of value recognized throughout the world, a national standard devised by theorists and manipulated by schemers. Every other attempt of the same kind in human history, under whatever circumstances, has reached similar results in kind, if not in degree. All of them show the existence of financial laws as real in their operation as those which hold the planets in their causes. For examples of similar effects in Russia, Austria, and Denmark, see Storch, Economique Politique, Volume 4, for similar effects in the U.S., see Gouget, Paper Money and Banking in the United States, also Sumner, History of American Currency. For working out of the same principles in England, depicted in a masterly way, see Macaulay, History of England, Chapter 21, and for curious exhibition of the same causes producing the same results in ancient Greece, see a curious quotation by Macaulay in the same chapter. I have now presented this history in its chronological order, the order of events. Let me, in conclusion, sum it up briefly in its logical order, the order of cause and effect. And first, in the economic department. From the early reluctant and careful issues of paper we saw as an immediate result, improvement and activity in business. Then arose the clamor for more paper money. At first, New issues were made with great difficulty, but the dike once broken, the current of irredeemable currency poured through, and the breach thus enlarging, this currency was soon swollen beyond control. It was urged on by speculators for a rise in values, by demagogues who persuaded the mob that a nation by its simple fiat could stamp real value to any amount upon valueless objects. As a natural consequence, a great debtor class grew rapidly, and this class gave its influences to depreciate more and more the currency in which its debts were to be paid. The government now began, and continued by spasms, to grind out still more paper. Commerce was at first stimulated by the difference in exchange, but this cause soon ceased to operate, and commerce, having been stimulated unhealthily, wasted away. We may want to recall the tech, commodity, and real estate booms of the past decade or so. To continue, manufacturers at first received a great impulse, but ere long this overproduction and overstimulus proved as fatal to them as to commerce. From time to time there was a revival of hope caused by an apparent revival of business, but this revival of business was at last seen to be caused more and more by the desire of far-seeing and cunning men of affairs to exchange paper money for objects of permanent value. What he means here is that people bought factories and businesses not because they wanted to revive them, but because they recognized that their money was heading the way of toilet paper. To continue. As to the people at large, the classes living on fixed incomes and small salaries felt the pressure first, as soon as the purchasing power of their fixed incomes were reduced. Soon the great class living on wages felt it even more sadly. Prices of the necessities of life increased. Merchants were obliged to increase them, not only to cover depreciation of their merchandise, but also to cover their risk of loss from fluctuation. And while the prices of products thus rose, wages, which had, had first gone up under the general stimulus, lagged behind. Under the universal doubt and discouragement, commerce and manufacturers were checked or destroyed. As a consequence, the demand for labor was diminished, 
laboring men were thrown out of employment, and under the operation of the simplest law of supply and demand, the price of labor, the daily wages of the laboring class, went down until, at a time when prices of food, clothing, and various articles of consumption were enormous, wages were nearly as low as at the time preceding the first issue of irredeemable currency. The mercantile classes at first thought themselves exempt from the general misfortune. They were delighted at the apparent advance in the value of the goods upon their shelves. But they soon found that, as they increased prices to cover the inflation of currency and the risk from fluctuation and uncertainty, purchases became less in amount and payments less sure. A feeling of insecurity spread throughout the country. Enterprise was deadened, and stagnation followed. New issues of paper were then clamored for as more drams are demanded by a drunkard. New issues not only increased the evil, capitalists were all the more reluctant to embark their money on such a sea of doubt. Workmen of all sorts were more and more thrown out of employment. Issue after issue of currency came, but no relief resulted save a momentary stimulus which aggravated the disease. The most ingenious evasions of natural laws in finance, which the most subtle theorists could contrive, were tried, all in vain. The most brilliant substitutes for those laws were tried, self-regulating schemes, interconverting schemes, all equally vain. All thoughtful men had lost confidence. All men were waiting. The stagnation became worse and worse. At last came the collapse, and then a return by a fearful shock to a state of things which presented something like certainty of remuneration to capital and labor. Then, and not till then, came the beginning of a new era of prosperity. Just as dependent on the law of cause and effect was the moral development. Out of the inflation of prices grew a speculating class, and in the complete uncertainty as to the future, all business became a game of chance, and all businessmen gamblers. In city centers came a quick growth of stock jobbers and speculators, and these set a debasing fashion in business which spread to the remotest parts of the country. Instead of satisfaction with legitimate profits came a passion for inordinate gains. Think CEO salaries in the modern world. Then, too, as values became more and more uncertain, there was no longer any motive for care or economy, but every motive for immediate expenditure and present enjoyment. So came upon the nation the obliteration of thrift. In this mania for yielding to present enjoyment rather than providing for future comfort, were the seeds of new growths of wretchedness, luxury, senseless and extravagant, set in. This, too, spread as a fashion. To feed it there came cheatery in the nation at large and corruption among officials and persons holding trusts. While men set such fashions in private and official business, women set fashions of extravagance in dress and living that added to the incentives to corruption. Faith in moral considerations, or even in good impulses, yielded to general mistrust. National honor was thought a fiction cherished only by hypocrites. Patriotism was eaten out by cynicism. And here, just by the by, we can see the same trends in postmodern philosophy with the depreciation of currencies around the world. To continue... Thus was the history of France logically developed in obedience to natural laws, such has, to a greater or lesser degree, always been the result of irredeemable paper created according to the whim or interest of legislative assemblies, rather than based upon standards of value permanent in their nature and agreed upon throughout the entire world. Such, we might fairly expect, will always be the result of them until the fiat of the Almighty shall evolve laws in the universe radically different from those which at present obtain. And finally, as to the general development of the theory and practice to which all this history records, 
My subject has been fiat money in France, how it came, what it brought, and how it ended. It came by seeking a remedy for a comparatively small evil, in an evil infinitely more dangerous. To cure a disease temporary in its character, a corrosive poison was administered, which ate out the vitals of French prosperity. It progressed according to a law in social physics, which we may call the law of accelerating issue and depreciation. It was comparatively easy to refrain from the first issue. It was exceedingly difficult to refrain from the second, to refrain from the third, and those following it was practically impossible. It brought, as we have seen, commerce and manufacturers, the mercantile interest, the agricultural interest, to ruin. It brought on these the same destruction which would come to a Hollander opening the dikes of the sea to irrigate his garden in a dry summer. It ended in the complete financial, moral, and political prostration of France, a prostration from which only a Napoleon could raise it. Or, we may say, any kind of modern militarism like Bush or Blair. To continue. But this history would be incomplete without a brief sequel showing how that great genius profited by all his experience. When Bonaparte took the consulship, the condition of fiscal affairs was appalling. The government was bankrupt and immense debt was unpaid. The further collection of taxes seemed impossible. The assessments were in hopeless confusion. War was going on in the East, on the Rhine, and in Italy, and civil war in Levante. All the armies had long been unpaid, and the largest loan that could for the moment be affected was for a sum hardly meeting the expenses of the government for a single day. At the first cabinet council, Bonaparte was asked what he intended to do. He replied, I will pay cash or pay nothing. From this time, he conducted all his operations on this basis. He arranged the assessments, funded the debt, and made payments in cash. And from this time, during all the campaigns in Marengo, Austerlitz, Jena, Eila, Freiland, down to the Peace of Tilsit in 1807, there was but one suspension of specie payment, and this only for a few days. When the first great European coalition was formed against the empire, Napoleon was hard-pressed financially, and it was proposed to resort to paper money. But he wrote to his minister, While I live, I will never resort to irredeemable paper. He never did. And France, under this determination, commanded all the gold she needed. When Waterloo came with the invasion of the Allies, with war on her own soil, with a change of dynasty and with heavy expenses for war and indemnities, France, on a specie basis, experienced no severe financial distress. If we glance at the financial history of France during the Franco-Prussian War and the Communist struggle in which a far more serious pressure was brought upon French finances than our own recent civil war put upon American finance, and yet with no national stagnation or distress, but with a steady progress in prosperity, we shall see still more clearly the advantage of meeting a financial crisis in an honest and straightforward way, and by methods sanctioned by the world's most costly experience, rather than by yielding to dreamers, theorists, phrasemongers, declaimers, schemers, speculators, or to that sort of reform which is the last refuge of a scoundrel. There is a lesson in all this which it behooves every thinking man to ponder. <laughs>